restating, restating this Herman of Logan. Adjustment of Logan. Um, the, um, that different genres have different capacities to think theologically. And it's important to be aware of that so that the composer, by a multi-series of genre is, uh, genres, is trying to make the reader aware both in micro and in macro, the entire book, and in practice, what does a theological genre, let us say, of folk or mythic narrative, of a liturgical confession, um, of silent gesture, um, as a cry of suffering, as debate. What do they do? What can they do? What do they express? That's very important. What do they express? Because they're limited by language, but they're also clearly expressive um, of a certain concern, we might say, if we just talk more broadly. Um, but they also have limits. Um, and um, how does the, narr- the composer help us become aware that gen- theological genres have expressibility capacities, um, both immediately and immediately, right? Um, in other words, some things strike us immediately, either what like Recruil might call the presentational immediacy of a metaphor. You immediately have a sense of what it is. You immediately have a sense of what a confession is. But then there are things that there's a space for reflection. And so you're also being urged to reflect on limit. How far can you go, right? Um, of course, when we come towards the end, we come to the paradox, right? To say, am us, I hate myself, I despise myself, that's both limit and expression. It's like you've come to the saying and non-saying simultaneously, right? There's saying and there is not, uh, there's unsaying. And then you have certain kind of points where saying and unsaying seem to be the Janus face, right? Where you say what you're unsaying simultaneously, um, and it's important to be brought to that. So I think that's, um, uh, Steve was trying to give the much, the, the larger theological framework. We now, we're shifting towards that specific issue of the genre issue. And the multi-genre character of the book can't simply be insignificant, at least from a redactional reception point of view. It may have all kinds of reasons for its composition, but ultimately, as a multi-layered, multi-genre composition, it requires thinking as itself a genre, right? As a way of um, saying, what does it mean to go through those various levels in terms of what they can do and what they limit in terms of that, okay? The, The wisdom tradition, obviously, is uh, the author of Job notes that the questions confronting Job are new ones, and that there is a, a sort of stock way of approaching them, um, and a set of answers having to do with the shortness of human life, making it difficult to get the perspective of how everything really does, what goes around comes around, um, and yeah, I think the speeches of uh, of Job's friends serve as a kind of a presupposed interlocutor that has to be dismissed. Okay, so what's interesting is uh, also, also to rephrase that, um, what we're being forced to confront is a very important issue that you don't begin theology in medias, or you begin it in medias race, but you don't begin it from nowhere. Right? You begin with what you have absorbed in your family, your linguistic tradition, your culture. That becomes the, or, the oral starting point before you even begin. Right? Now, there's always going to be a certain series of theological presuppositions 
that you have been born into, that you've reflected on, you haven't reflected on, um, you think that you'll go off the cliff if you think about them, but you won't necessarily go off the cliff, or whatever. But the, but, the, but, the, but the important consideration to begin with is that a person is, there's no presuppositionless starting point. The same way we want to, we will kind of also come to the point of view that there will be no presuppositionless experience, right? Um, uh, those of you maybe who have read or should read, it's an older book now, it's a generation old, but the book by um, Wayne Proudfoot on religious experience, he taught religion, I don't know if he's still teaching at Columbia, but it was written in the 70s. And one of his critiques, let us say, of Schleiermacher, we'll come back to this, where the claim was there can be a kind of radical, absolute religious experience, um, is that even that presupposes a certain notion of what a religious experience would be, what an experience is, how one processes that, as if one could have an absolute pure experience. Right? So we're saying that even the notion of having a crisis and recognizing it as having a shattering or an implication on what one has already received as a first layer requires a presupposition layer of what are the boundaries of what would hold your mental universe together. So this notion that there is a prior tradition and then there are layers are extremely important. I think um, the very fact of putting this within the wisdom tradition as such and not just articulating this as the book of Deuteronomy is to keep our eyes fixed on the universal, right? Uh, obviously, the universal has the particular character of the way the wisdom tradition and the Deuteronomic tradition of reward and punishment and their correlation come together. So it's not simply the one or the other, it's a very, very strategic and cagey blend of the two. Nevertheless, um, he wants you to be thinking about that because that already sets up a juxtaposition. You know, can you think past the Deuteronomic tradition or the wisdom tradition or the blending of the two and still stay in the game? Or do you come to a new standpoint, which is like a new Sinai, right? That's, uh, so that, uh, does that more or less capture part of what you're getting at? Okay, Adrian. Sure, coming to your, your point, it's fascinating and striking how radical the book of Job is, how it is an exercise of radical epoche, if I may use that term, like putting in suspense of um, even the wisdom tradition. I think it tries, it, it, it takes it to the limit, but then one would argue it actually breaks it. It breaks that, uh, that let's say, that safety in that or that net. So, and and uh, uh, it, uh, another example of that, which you remind me, is the Bhagavad Gita, which, which in the, in the uh, Hindu tradition, which, which is a similar exercise of suspending and, and radicalizing and reaching a, 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 a point of no return, but of a new beginning. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, I think, quite important to uh, the, let's say the hermeneutical exercise is an exercise for for transformation and conversion, right? And this is probably what I think the <clears throat> let's say the modern some of the modern hermeneutical thinking before repair or before government didn't understand that that you need that radicalization to do right hermeneutics. Right. That uh, the true hermeneutics is not uh, uh, trying to reach that presuppositionless, mm -hmm. right? You reach it, but but to a radical epoche. And I think the book exemplifies that. Uh, I mean, I have a hard time finding another example right, where, right. where you see that. Uh, perform. Yeah. It's sort of like Moliere. You're speaking prose and you didn't know it. So um, the um, so the Book of Job is doing radical hermeneutics 
without knowing it. In other words, when, as I was listening to you speak, it links up with what Logan was saying. In a certain sense, the epoche is both literary genre and it's cognitive. It's epistemic. So you have to suspend your own thinking as you enter the text and then you are placed in a series of boxes in terms of what is sayable within that and they become exercises for thought within those frameworks. But nevertheless, you have these multiple frameworks. And then I think that the issue that Adrian was pointing out about uh, the Gita and so on, just think of what you even have within scripture that's comparable in that way. So there, there is um, a voice that, there's a voice that speaks at the beginning of Genesis. Let's leave aside all the traditional explanations. There's, a, there's an anonymous voice that speaks at the beginning of Genesis. And that anonymous voice seems to know everything. And it speaks the world in terms of order. Right? that the world is filled with very particular taxonomy of division. Who that voice is, the text is very, uh, the text knows God's knowing. Okay? The next time that we might want to figure on a voice that's speaking is the voice that speaks at Sinai. Well, that's a voice that's essentially will. Right? It's giving commandments of things that the human should do within the space of that taxonomy, right? So in a certain sense, it's an orderly voice that more or less is fitting in to the voice of the world of, of, that has been created by a divine speech as well, right? So it's a speech within a speech. And the reason that I'm thinking about what Adrian is saying about the Gita is that when this literary God opens God's mouth in Genesis 38, um, all that comes out are the tangle of created life. Right? It's just like the voice opens up and you don't have the order of creation. You don't have the the will of what one should do. You simply have the, the massive variety of things just flowing out of the mouth of God. Right? The mouth of God now is like a creative source. It's not a source of will and it's not a source of world order in the sense of distinctions. It's the distinctiveness of everything that is. It comes out of the mouth of God as it were. It's a different form of understanding divine speech or logos, however you want to understand it from your tradition, right? Um, but you think about it, these are different kinds of forms of an epoche. What would be to live within any of those three realms would be a very distinct choice or whether one could live within all. Okay, but the book is um, um, giving us uh, people who are discussing the orderly... The, the, the discussion between the friends is some kind of mental exercise to coordinate the first and the second voices. Right? There is some kind of relationship between action that believes it's performing God's will that's in some kind of relationship to the natural order. And they're trying to figure out the harmony or the disharmony or how much of a dislocation is possible before you're out of the game. Right? You know, how much, how much dissonance can you tolerate between those two fundamental voices on the assumption that those are fundamental voices? The third voice takes you to a very different plane. Right? And we may, and where I want to go towards the end of the class is to see whether that third voice can lead to a new notion of how one could live normatively 
within a, a divine voice that speaks that way. Right? It's a different form of commandments that Job is confronted with. Right? Tzvi. Uh, following up on what Steve uh, mentioned regarding the presupposition of the existence of God and also about the two verses, uh, it seems that it is exactly the presupposition which enables to distinguish between this work and like a given philosophical work and so far that the discussion of philosophical concepts cannot be determined and always remain undetermined and in light of the fact that there's always this kind of breaking of this divine, infinite kind of experience of Job and therefore concepts and the philosophical discussion can never come to an end, it can never be settled. And in this, in this aspect, Job kind of challenges how we read and experience that given philosophical works where we do, where we don't have, we, we don't begin with a presupposition, but a very, the, the most radical presupposition is a very exception, the exception of expecting the final kind of determination which will be led, which will, we will be led to through our uh, determined kind of discussion, mm-hmm. and here this kind of this break, right. which is enable, which becomes possible only because of the presupposition. So this actually, uh, Svi's point is bringing together a number of the points: is how far back can the mind of presupposition go? You can't step out. You can step outside of the text. You can close the text, right? But you can you can't step out of the universe, or you can't step into a presuppositionless or transcendental presuppositionless issue, at least not um, self-consciously. And then the question would be, does this kind of a book, as much as any kind of theological book could do that, shake the foundation of presuppositions or make, make call to awareness in a non-philosophical work, the implication of presupposition, right? So a number of these things are coming together. Let's have a couple of more new voices, and then I want to just um, bring some of this stuff together. I think I've said more or less everything that I had in mind in relation to you guys have brought. Does anybody else want to bring anything else up that I haven't heard? Let me just see if I can get anybody who hasn't spoken yet. Anybody want to risk something. Anything new. Okay, Steve, why don't you make a comment, then I'm going to bring some of this in, then I want to move on. I think it's the theology of not knowing. I think all of the theology that we've had before this was the theology of knowing. There's an order, there's a will, and now I'm giving you a wild factor of not knowing. And that's a very new concept. You're knowing and not knowing. Knowing and not knowing. <laughs> but there is a knowing of this not knowing. Yeah, too. Knowing so. of a not knowing, which is a new theological concept that this book is introducing by shaking up through the rupture the first two okay. premises. Right. So let me just, I'm going to come back to a couple of things, but let me just um, throw out one other thing that you might want to be thinking about. Right. Um, so, so soon after the most prime evil discussion of the order of creation, we have that astonishing narrative of the Garden of Eden, right? And so, and the two trees. One is knowledge, and the other is life. Those are the two primary, primordial dimensions that the biblical narrator is saying that's constitutive of the conscious person. It's written from the point of view of the conscious person how close and how do you negotiate these two primordial structures, which are God-given structures? The mystery of knowledge, right? right? And the mystery of life. I'm just thinking now, um, there's a famous, um, many of you know it, I hadn't planned to discuss it, but I'll just mention it. There's, um, 
uh, Wittgenstein only gave one public lecture in his life around 1929 on ethics. And when he was trying to discuss what absolute value is, right, something that you can't conceive, he said, among other things, that there are two feelings that come to his mind as a way of responding to the absoluteness. And one is that you could know anything, which means you have the mystery of language to know anything. You can't get outside that. You can't get beyond that, prime, that absolute mystery that there is the fact of knowing and that's known in language and you can never get outside that. So it becomes, it's an absolute. And you can only stare in wonder at that of such an astonishing mystery. And the other mystery, so that's the tree of knowledge. And the other mystery is that there is a world. That there simply is a world. You can't step outside of that consciousness. You could never step outside the consciousness that there is the fact of life that's all around us. And you can't step outside that and look at life from the outside any more than you can step outside of knowledge and look at knowledge from the outside. Right? So the mystery of this, of the parable of Eden, or the myth of Eden, or the theological truth of Eden, however you want to go at it, is that there are two divine structures that you're called to give witness to that you can never get inside. You have to be careful how you touch them or incorporate them, like eating them, right? So eating is a form of incorporation or the desire of the eyes is the desire to have it, right? To absorb it, right? And those distinctions, of course, become the distinctions of the law as well. What are the limits of knowing and living? Right? Are there limits and boundaries? So the traditions will talk about that. Right? The Mosaic tradition and the Jewish and the Christian and the Muslim are going to deal with that as a kind of um, tradition of possibility, right? which breaks down, obviously, in the book of Job, because, because it's working at it. It's an infinite divine truth of which the revelation is one cultural mode of expression. Right? And then the book of Job brings those two trees together as a subject of simultaneous meditation. The meditation on knowledge and the meditation on life in about as primal a way as you can get and still stay within the framework of traditional language. Right? Although when you get towards the end, you're pretty close to the noumenal aha moment where knowledge and life come together in this truly mysterious stereoscopic point, right? That's the strangeness of this book that becomes a the two eyes of the two trees cross in one remarkable moment in those last chapters in this kind of stereoscopic vision. And then where we're going to have to move towards the, as the course develops, is whether from that crossing one can then rebuild a religious life 
let's say, or can I rebuild a religious life in the modern, in the sense, in other words, I'm keeping it personal, but I want you to be thinking about that too. So, the book of Job then, as a book, just in biblical terms, is raising these very fundamental presuppositions, and at the deepest, deepest core are these paradigmatic structures that are absolute. And it's trying to meditate on that. So then, when we now turn to the medieval and the other discussions, we'll see how various people are trying to pivot around which is the real important pole, right? Is it knowledge that helps you think about life? Is it life that helps you think about knowledge? How do these, um, how does these, do these DNA things intertwine? Like what is the knowledge part of DNA and what is the life part of DNA, as it were? Adrian, you wanted to say something. Oh, no, no, it only reminded me of Einstein that uh, that was his argument for the for the deistic argument that the way that the world is the miracle is that the world is explainable. Oh, right. and, uh, that for explainable, but not necessarily the truth. <laughs> there is an order yeah. yes, that yes, we yes, can yes. know. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and order, and, and order. Not the order, order, but and order. And it goes all right. The right. old man might, might be tricky, but he doesn't take dice. That's right. That's right. Anybody else want to say anything before we move on? Yes. So, um, uh, I tried my best. I was educated as a communist. Uh, I converted to Christianity late in my life. But I never really got out the uh, Hegelian or maybe Marx and for Bahia, understanding for religion, that religion is built on the conscience. So, um, my question for these two deep structures that you just mentioned is very interesting. So, how many possibilities that we can logically can put these two paradigms together in a system? Like, uh, if they are conflicting, if we are provide uh, some sort of a mystic solutions, suppose like our conscious connected with mind, with God's mind, so that would become semi divine. So we solve the problem with uh, knowledge by connecting with God. We we'll solve the problem with life by also somehow become eternal. So my question is really this in the change of uh, Job's consciousness, is that really he is creating something new, complete, that unseen before? Or is that the rudimentary structure is already somehow embedded or possible fluid in before his consciousness, just being highlighted by his experience and being nuanced out? So somehow he might change, but he is still the same one. So I would prefer, I don't still trying to see whether we see his development as an expansion of himself or enlargement. Or should we see a revolution? So is so the question to you, or my question to you, is is there a point where the quantitative becomes qualitative? Is there a point where my natural self gives me a vision where I'm not the same and I see things in a radically different way. I'm not saying, it's, I agree that there's never a point that can never be not natural coming out of the self unless one assumes that there's some spiritual core of the soul that's now been tapped and erupts. That may be another way to get at that same issue that the soul has been covered over by so many layers of natural consciousness that there is something that's responding in a new way that religion talks about as soul but is but that is part of our natural endowment even if God has breathed the soul into us it's there somewhere right so whether we talk, uh, we, I wouldn't so I wouldn't want to talk necessarily in a Feuerbachian reductionist way I would say well you start with the Job in self, but something emerges that 
change. And we could say that's mind, you can call that soul. You can start the divine spirit has been touched by another spirit from the outside. However you do it, but he, the self-consciousness that he was is now a new thing, wouldn't you say? Does that, does that get at what you're focusing on? Then Logan has other things, but... Yes. Uh, I'm trying to push you as far as possible to your yeah, yeah, communist I'm, roots. <laughs> yeah. So I'm rebelling against that, but uh, I'm still just trying to say. So what's the conflict inside you as uh, between being born a communist and having been converted to Christianity? Does that is that where the tension lies? There's no presupposition for me as a god or any of that superstructure. It's uh, merely ideological construction reflecting highlighting, absolutized human experience. That's the traditional way of thinking. After I've converted, I have a dramatic converting experience. So I've come really in war of this God. But uh, as I'm processing in myself, in thinking, and getting more and more, and I come to a little bit back, like William James. Right, right, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thinking. So uh, my question for really is a struggling is that I think the solution somehow become a mystic solution. In the end, in Christianity, which means meaning what? Meaning what? Meaning that uh, through the fear of God, we become, we have the true wisdom. But the fear of God. So you're saying that something in the soul is related to what we would call the fear of God, in other words, and that's what's being elicited. Yeah. That that changes consciousness. In other words, it's not necessarily a cognitive knowledge. Yes. It is a a certain form of something that's elicited that the natural self had resisted. Yeah, you might say that. I'm still trying to think in this room, so I'm not really... Clear. But something close to that, because the fear, even the communists, even Marx knows that he has a limitation on knowledge, that we have to stop, that we have to jump. But the jumping point it seems to me like the fear of God, or maybe the last they, they have some disconnection between human knowledge and divine somehow transform their knowledge itself. So you might say it's not a purely cognitive or intellectual, but it becomes something in substance that through this field. Of yeah, so uh, I'm going to go to, to Loga. I just wanted to, um, as you were talking, the association that I had, and it's, a, it's something that's related to this when we're talking about soul or the development of the soul. Um, um, it's something in a very, very early essay that um, Rav Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, touched upon. That is to say, when you're talking about the, one of the mysteries that, that you're touching on is that the self is no, doesn't just search for food and permanence, but the self yearns for something else. That he described as the search for God, but that is something that's already, we might, in this context, we're talking about his soul. But what we're trying to say is that, the, without talking about divine creation of the soul or Genesis, but we're saying that the, the human being has these two drives. One is for life and permanence, we might say, and the other is for meaning, right? And that one is pulling, they're pulling in complicated ways. So, but that's, that is as primordial as the Adamic self that's already given this divine quality, you might say. Or it's a different thing than just being, you're out of the earth and you also have something else that's not just the earth. That seems to be something we all know from our own bodies. The text is giving a certain, yeah. I think something that may address your kind of question or concern in Job is that he had a hedge built around him at the beginning. And that's mm -hmm. kind of an unnatural structure that seems to insulate him from experiencing this divine power at first. Mm -hmm. And then when that kind of construction of the hedge floats away, then he can experience this kind of power. And that is where the transformation comes in. So the hedge you can really substitute, really, at, at least, I think, whatever you want for that hedge, just anything. All kinds of cognitive, natural, mm -hmm. all yeah. kinds of things. Everything, everything, that everything that blocks the self from that quest. Mm 
Yeah, and just because it's a hedge doesn't mean it's necessarily natural. It could be like an ideology or anything. Mm -hmm. Adrian, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just read to okay. what my communist brother. <laughs> okay, there's a, a meeting between, between <laughs> China and Romania. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't think the distinction. I mean, natural. Uh, it's not that it's cognitive or what else is it? It is, it is a holistic experience, right? I don't, I don't think that the distinction applies. Is it emotional? Is it cognitive? But then, uh, uh, right, one point, the second point, three, writing people, right, the, the way in, indeed there is a continuity between the natural and this, let's say, cosmic awareness, uh, which Job ends up having at the end, right? But like, as he moves from, a, let's say, as you say, from a state of being hedged then to an interesting natural, natural cosmic theology, if I may use the word, but then that still isn't the final perspective, because even there he seems to be seeing a divine presence, or I'm going to use providence for lack of a better word, but in from his own hedge perspective, but at the end, the, the perspective seems to be very, is still a cosmic providence, but not centered on him, right? But uh, but that does that end point is not counter natural, right? And if I may use the Christian lingo, uh, it, it is exactly that is the meaning of divine consciousness. Divine consciousness is not counter natural. It is precisely the fulfillment of naturalness, uh, right? Or in the language of the Eastern tradition, we would say it's a kind of a, uh, the economy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the, it's the, the incarnation. The, it's exactly that's right. the meaning of the economy. Of the, right. Right? the incarnation right. is not uh, suffocating human nature right. or or destroying it in any. But way. allows it to manifest. This is the meaning of the hypostasis. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Uh, uh, theology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else want to say anything before we move to Maimonides? So anyway, this is giving us at least some preliminary sense of the presupp thinking about presuppositions, that there are presuppositions in the text. And now we're going to go to several examples in the history of religious thought to try to see what are the presuppositions that are there, and then gradually we'll move towards... Um, then I want to conclude today by talking about what, uh, how Job could be a prologue for contemporary theology as we move forward. In other words, how try to re-examine what some of our presuppositions that we might bring to this after we take a look at what some of the other thinkers have to do. So, um, so that we can do, let's just take a look at some selections. Let's begin with the Maimonides. Get your text out so we can be sharing that together. So, first thing in terms of genre, right? This is part of a work of speculative, rational, philosophical theology. which then means that the author has a um, commanding authority over what's being said. The author is not the author of the book of Job. The author is Maimonides, who is taking the material of the book of Job within his own epistemological and theological framework and reformulating that in abstract, conceptual, and prose terms. So insofar 
as there is discourse and dialogue, it's cited discourse and dialogue. It's not what we would see to be the actuality of people having to face one another. And, you know, who stands down and who, does, who backs off, which is part of what this um, testing is between the friends. You know, each one is trying to say to the other, stand down. And the other one is saying, no, I'm going to ignite my rocket. And they <laughs> stand down. And they, they, keep, they face off um, theologically. And so that becomes um, an issue. So we have a philosophical conception within a work that has a commanding sense of what knowledge is and what philosophical wisdom could be. So he's going to, as we'll see, um, Job is going to be uh, an emergent philosopher. He's going to come to the ideal point or he's going to help you see that this is the book of Job is now directly spoken of as a mashal, as a parable. That's one of the ways that the rabbis speak about that in the Talmud. That Job didn't exist and never existed, but it's simply a parable. That's one of the positions in Baba Batra in the Talmud, right? And since for Maimonides, the perplexities of scripture are dealt with in terms of parables. The perplexity of evil or the apparent existence of evil and how a person orients themselves, that has to be understood in parable as a job becomes a parable for thinking about this. It's, a sort of, it's an exercise of thinking and the book itself then is recategorized as a propedeutic, as a kind of preparatory teaching of wisdom. In other words, we see the book as an educational counsel. When we read the book of Job, we're just caught up in the middle of this, right? But Maimonides' presupposition is that this is placed in the Bible as a wisdom, as a counsel, as a wisdom etza, as a kind of um, uh, issue. And then you can see from the very beginning that Maimonides states his presuppositions um, about God right away, right? Um, that he speaks about uh, divine omniscience and everything um, was known by him. Everything was caused by him, so there's absolute divine causation. And there's no wrongdoing that can be ascribed to him. So the absolute starting point here is this larger framework which causes the, tri the tribulation of Job. His tribulation is precisely because there's a presupposition which he's ha going to have to change his mind to and everybody's caught in that cognitive web, right? That God knows everything, God causes everything, and God is absolute justice, right? So that becomes um, a starting point. So then how does uh, Maimonides text? Anybody want to take us through certain sections of how Maimonides presents his, um, his argument. Anybody take any notes or want to? I yeah. just have a quick clarifying question about the Elihu sections. When about did people begin to realize that the Elihu sections were a later addition to the text? Like what my mom is aware of. Well, he sort of gives us a hint that he's yeah. aware that it's a very different structure. I think that's more of a modern okay. discussion um, from a critical historical point of view. Yeah. From Maimonides' point of view, he says, well, it's, he's sort of like a Straussian, right? He's, <laughs> he's, saying, he's saying the same thing, but he's camouflaging his real issue 
so that if you're able to penetrate it, you can see for the first time that God teaches through suffering. Right? Um, but he is not going to present that unless you can really perceive that uh, somewhat on your, on your own. So that's really a late, it's a later discussion. Um, I, mean, I guess we could turn to that section. Well, let, let's just, I just want to make sure that everybody gets a sense of um, how does Maimonides proceed? Anybody just want to get a dove? I mean, the key method for him seems to be paraphrase. You know, the genre is less important paraphrase and extract the general argument of each character. At the very end he says, I've summed up all its notions um, and as you say, this is now a rational debate and the genre kind of flattened out the dynamic Right, so we have, it is a kind of meta-perspective rather than being caught up in the specifics of the argument so that the different types of arguments reflect different natural attitudes or places on the spectrum of the tradition. Some people are simply common persons. Well, Job begins, as it were, according to my mind, he's a kind of Aristotelian. He's just a natural person. We'll see that in the section that I gave you from Soloveitchik, where he picks up on that in a second, but that he's in, he's, he has this eudaimonistic perspective. He wants to live and he wants to live well. And that's the way, so he's just a natural person. So Maimonides, on the one hand, wants to do a kind of a double lens on the material. On, the, on one lens, that each of the friends represent a stage of traditional understanding, right? So there are different stages. Some say that God punishes immediately and directly. So there is a kind of clear equivalence, and then Job doesn't really understand that he must have done something, right? If he's getting it, he... And then there may be that God punishes so that you will repent and you will come to a new level of consciousness, right? or that it's deferred for a period of time and the task now is to suppress your judgment and God will reward you in the end. So you have a series of perspectives that are within the her cognitive horizon that God is omnipotent, all-knowing, causes everything and is just. It's just that it doesn't necessarily play out the way it would work out in terms of buying an ice cream in a drugstore that you give 10 cents and you get something back, right? So um, life is more than buying ice cream with an exchange, right? Theology is more than a simple exchange between one thing. I do something and I get something back, okay? So it's raising this beyond that level, right? You don't pay the uh, washing machine repairman, he won't fix your washing machines. You can't complain if your clothes are dirty. All right, so it's trying to get you out of that as he's presenting a more trivial consciousness, but it's the consciousness of the natural person who thinks within a very low horizon, right? So we're talking, cognition is dealing with different types of horizons, right? The first order of horizon is I don't want to get sick and I don't want my family to get sick. And since there was no prepay life insurance, you have to trust in God, so you don't want anybody to get sick and you don't want any goons to destroy your town. So that's the eudaimon. And you want to do things that will maximize. Everything is utilitarian, right? The natural person is utilitarian. Religion serves a function, right? You don't serve God for nothing. You serve God for something. So that you'll live, you'll be well, your family will be well, 
you know, the uh, demons will stay outside the gate, and so on and so forth. And then you have a series of cognitive breaks with that, but within the framework of the tradition, because he has all of these opinions in the tradition, he now orders them as structures of mind. Because, from his point of view, the whole book is an instruction of different types um, of consciousness, right? So, on the one hand, Maimonides will present us this from the point of view of the friends, but then he maps that on to the medieval discussion, too. So, now we see another presupposition, right? He needs to read the book of Job as reflecting the spectrum of philosophical opinions in his own day, right? He's not just reading the book of Job as simply a biblical text, but he has already done what we need to do as we move forward, right? He's doing hermeneutical theology, and he has reclassified Job as an Aristotelian, and Eli Faz as a certain kind of Islamic philosopher, and so on and so forth. And so he maps the territory from the point of view of, of a hermeneutic reclaiming or reappropriation of the Job narrative. So the Job na- so he's not just doing philo- abstract philosophical theology. He's also locating himself within a spectrum of possibilities because he's trying to do a Jewish philosophical theology that will move beyond the pagan Aristotelian notion, I don't mean that in any pejorative sense, but or against the Islamic range of positions, right? He didn't know the Christian position, so he's simply presenting the range of Islamic philosophy that he was aware of. Yes? Uh, on this part of Maimonides' um, presentation, it's at 494. I was a little bit surprised because he, he identifies Eliphaz with, um, he says Eliphaz is keeping with the opinion of our law. Yeah. Uh, whereas the others are uh, associated with various Islamic theological schools. Um, and I thought that was kind of a, I mean, I, I suppose I know what he means by that, a sort of straightforward reading of the Deuteronomistic. Right. In other words, it's the, it's the, the people that he doesn't have much respect for from a philosophical point of view. In other words, mere piety without a philosophical sensibility and consciousness is going to get you into all kinds of perplexities. So it's not as if piety as obedience is not a value, but it doesn't, if the real task is to transcend opinion, which is the perplexity of what's taking place in front of you for real wisdom, to get out of the cave, right? Then you get out of the cave by a new level of knowledge. So I don't think he... um, It's the same as in the parable of the palace and so on. Certain people are very far away. And um, he doesn't see them as father, really father removed from primitive people, right? In other words, they're simply doing things for their own benefit, although they may be observing, but it's really for their own personal benefit, and they're being pious, and then they get trapped by cognitive dissonance, and he's trying to escape from cognitive dissonance. Can you get to another place where, to the degree to which we're human, we can have a meta-perspective? Now, he can't take you outside of wisdom, but he's going to try to get to as meta a place as possible within um, his his orientation. Does that, uh, did you, was that more where you were going? I was sort of, there are places in the guide where Maimonides uh, sort of seems to hint that reward and punishment 
uh, in the way that I suppose Ali Fawz or whoever he's uh, <coughs> attributing that idea to is kind of uh, not real. Uh, he calls it a you know, necessary opinion, something that people have to believe in, um, but it does not really describe the way the world works. And I was wondering if that if he was sort of showing his cards on that. It may be, it may be a hint, but he's more just trying to stake out everything is divine will or everything is a providential issue. He's trying to stake these out um, in more simple terms in this particular case. There may be, they, you, you know, if you want to read these kind of super allusions back and forth, you can do that. But he's, I think, just trying, he's teach, using the book of Job as a series of propedeutics of types, all of which are acceptable within orthodox piety but they don't get you out of the bubble of perplexity. And they don't get you into a philosophical space. So he wants to get you to a philosophical space that's still a religious consciousness. He doesn't want to get you to a philosophical space that's purely philosophical. Then you'd be back to Aristotle. He wants to get you to a philosophical consciousness where that links up, as he will say, with the love and fear of God, right? And that you can then go on with your religious life without expecting reward and punishment as if that was um, the way it works for a philosopher. It may work when you're three years old, but he's saying it doesn't necessarily work when you've gone the whole route. So... What's the medieval archetype that's associated with the The other friends are associated with. Job is associated with. Uh, he, uh, he, it's, I don't think it is. There is a medieval type for that. I think he wants. I think that's where he sees the first breakthrough. The first breakthrough is because the for Maimonides there are two types of breakthroughs. The first breakthrough for Elihu is a prophetic breakthrough. So the prophetic, he sees Elihu as having a prophetic teaching. And the prophetic teaching, he says, it looks like he's saying everything that everybody said before, but if you look carefully, he's telling you that through suffering, through dreams, through turbulations, God is already speaking to you. But if you haven't focused your mind to see, if you've only been thinking about that in terms of reward and punishment, rather than an instruction of, let's say, humility or the value of suffering to understand your place in the world, we'll see, we have to see how Cohen deals with that from but he sees that as prophecy. And then there will be a breakthrough beyond prophecy to a certain kind of philosophical awareness, which, which will tally with the prophetic dimension. Right? It will tally with the prophetic dimension, but it stands on its own. Okay? So if, you, uh, if we go to Maimonides all the way um, to the end, let me just say, say this again, then, yeah, then we will, um, let's just go towards where, where Maimonides wants to get our consciousness to is um, to come to terms with the limitation of what we would call nominalism or natural inference. That because we name things in a certain way, that's exactly the way things are. And he wants you um, to come to the realization that when we use terms, we're using terms and language like reward and punishment from within a very low level human grammar. And what Job will come to through the whirlwind 
is that the divine order of things is a cosmic gift of the general providence or that God provides for things. It's not that God oversees in a certain way, but God provides for the general order of all life. And our language of, of correlation between what God gives and what we are receiving is a lower level of consciousness. So he wants to bring you to this realization that the names that we use and the way we interpret reality is highly anthropomorphic and anthropocentric. And that if you can break through that, which is the philosophical breakthrough at the end, right? You reground your belief. You know? You reground your belief because you realize that you can bear suffering because you are a part of the divine natural order that so transcends our limited perspective of things that you immediately, he says, you love God. And you move toward, from that wisdom, you move to the love of God. In other words, this becomes Maimonides' archetypal statement in the guide and what he, the way he begins, for example, his Mishnah Torah and his law. That is to say that the, that, the, that the consciousness of a person that's opened up to the transcendent divine order marvels at the mysterious wisdom of the natural structures of the physics of things and moves from this wonder at the physics of things towards the love of God in a truly metaphysical sense. So you move from the fear of God to the love of God. Now, as you become aware of this massive divine structure that totally uh, orders the universe, which begins at the sense of reverence, it moves to love, and it transcends the personal feeling of suffering. And through that love of God, you're able to overcome what we would normally consider to be the petty sufferings or the particular sufferings. Because you, we re, you relocate yourself in the cosmic order. And the divine order is so massive and so transcendent that the only response has to be reverence and love. Now, that doesn't answer my pain. And we'll see that Herman Cohen will have to say, what do I do with the pain that I have of my suffering? Right? But for Maimonides, there is, um, you can, he says, you can bear suffering without doubt. Right? So that's where he wants to get the beginning point of the book of Job to transform one's religious life then is, to be, is not to deny anything, but to realize that the frame of understanding has to be radically widened. And that brings a person to a philosophical awareness and love of God and one would go on and observe the commandments and do everything that one needs to do for the order of the universe and the order of society, but not assume that what was taught to people to keep them at a lower level of consciousness in order is the true meaning of what a philosopher would understand. So the, the part of the Torah is to teach those people who need to be kept within that harness, in that harness, 
But that is that first level, and the philosophical consciousness is a different type of consciousness. But the book of Job is in the Bible to help you realize that that is where you have to go. Right? The people at one level at Sinai and Deuteronomy are at a certain level of religious consciousness for the good of the polity and the society. So the book of Job is one of the many hints that that is not the end of the spiritual or intellectual path. And it's in scripture to make you realize that that is a breakthrough of consciousness that you have to get beyond the common teaching for the common person. So it's not, you see, it's not a book now that's philosophical book that's coming from the outside. It's a, div- it's a parable that has been included in scripture for teaching philosophical wisdom within the context of scripture. So there may be the teaching of reward and punishment which is not necessarily a teaching but it's just a, it's an exhortation and a caution but true teaching is incorporated in scripture if you know how to read that text because he wants to get you not to be a philosopher but to have a philosophical awareness in your religious life right so he, nothing that he's saying means that you don't go back and observe the commandments which are for the sake of the uh, for the sake of the society you can't have life on earth without or an orderly society the question is what is the attitude of the person from the inside out. And he wants to get you to a new level of reverence and now something the book of Job never talked about, namely to love of God and the bearing of suffering. Now you can see that he's not totally answering the problematic of the book of Job or the movement of Job back into the world because he's trying to rebuild a philosophical theology out of the language of scripture and within his own categories of parable of philosophical parables right and that this book if it's read right is a propedeutic it leads you through these various stages to the end and to a certain degree the prophetic consciousness gets you to the same place as the philosophical Right? But uh, the philosophical is the more universal and it's the more comprehensive. And so ultimately, Elihu does say what is said at the end, but he says it in the point of view of, of a kind of revealed philosophical truth about this. So he's able to have nomos and revelation and philosophical illumination and they come together in an integrated way. Um, but, the, but the point that I... Um, and so, so in the process, he transforms the notion of divine governance. Right? Providence is not kind of the later... It's not even a, the... Um, th- that's really a, a Christian term. The Jewish term would be hashgacha, but it's not that God um, is uh, overseeing everything, but God provides everything. So it's a new notion of governance as providence, as God providing everything. And that that's part of the governance, but it is at a level of transcendental understanding that we don't understand the the logic will always be a human logic and he wants you to come to that awareness even though you can't step outside of it right so he's again bringing us to the point but the point that I, I want to stress in these cases is that he too is trying to help he's trying to rebuild a theological life 
through the book of Job, that the book of Job becomes a paradigmatic moment in scripture that helps you transcend the limitations of the triviality of reward and punishment of Deuteronomy. So other medievals would solve it differently. So for example, the Maharal of Prague might say, for example, well, if you look at Deuteronomy, it's stated by Moses. It's not stated by God. So it's Moses as a teacher trying to give exhortations to the people based on his own attempt to keep the people in order. But that's not necessarily the theological truth. It's the pedagogical practicality of you have to housebreak the kids. Right? It's a housebreaking. You know, it's like kids are like little dogs and you have to keep them. And then once they're housebroken, then you can train them to be thinkers and philosophers. But he's saying that's Moses because Moses is trying to keep this order well, you know, so you can go out to recess if you sit still for 45 minutes or something like that. Where is it in the Where he discusses, it's on Schava Onish. Yeah. So anyway, but what I'm trying to indicate is that many other people would come at that point, but Maimonides wants to co- come at it from his own philosophical point of view. But you could come to that same conclusion that this is Moses' pedagogical instruction from a different point of view, but it's not, the ch- Moses is not claiming that this is the theological truth, it's a pedagogical truth. Right? But all of this presupposes two things. One is there is a certain dissonance in different levels of understanding. Right? And to go on with your religious life, you have to solve the cognitive dissonance that you have. That's where we're going to have to be going as well. Right? Because we have, live in a different universe with different understandings of many things in a postmodern world that's different, let us say, from a pious person in the 19th or 20th century. And then can you go on with the tradition if the cognitive structure is different? So all of what he is doing is you have to repair the cognitive structure first before you can go back to say whether the tradition can be lived. Right? That's the essential correlation. What gets broken down is interesting. What gets broken down is the cognitive structure at the natural level. And from the the world of science or the world of postmodernism, they raise new kinds of questions, but we live within that framework and that that breaks down this other theological structure which was based on a very different cognitive map of faith and understanding. So what Maimonides is actually showing us from one point of view is the need, the same way Job has to rebuild it from the ground up, Maimonides is now rebuilding the cognitive structure before he can make a correlation with traditional teachings. Right? The traditional teachings just hang in the air or they break down, but you first have to rebuild the cognitive map to see whether you can make a correlation back to the tradition, right? And that, in a certain sense, is the theological task. And we can see it's already starting here, right? Or it starts in a certain way with Job himself. Now we're seeing Maimonides is doing that from one point of view. So let's have a couple of things that I want to jump to Herman Cohen, because he raises something else. But you can, can you all see what, what's involved here that there's a rebuilding of the religious anthropology before the theology, right? The, 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 or the theological anthropology has to be reconsidered and you have to be all right with that to then do the task of relating that life back to the commandments, right? Because the naivete has been shattered. Right? So now the, the task of theology is a, re, a different kind of rebuilding if it's going to work, which took place 
from the earliest times on. But the question is, how do you do it in this particular era if you want to? Some people say that it's not even worth it. But if it is worth it, then, then that has to be reground in a new way. Right? Anybody want to come in on anything like that before we take a look at Mr. Cohen? which, let's say, uh, philosophical framework fits or is appropriate for, uh, for let's say, performing this uh, exodus from the naive, from, from a natural utilitarian naivete, right? Is, uh, what allows you to make the decision, right? Either, like for us today, should we use the phenomenology, should we use the uh, the construction should use Marxism, uh, right? I mean, well, I think I think that we're going to have to come to that. But I think yeah. the short the short answer the, the short answer is that it has to it has to utilize at one level traditional hermeneutics and the core scriptures of the tradition. And it also has to be more than idiosyncratic. It has to be re-embedded in a community. Right? So in other words, it's to restructure the cognitive claims is to somehow link those cognitive claims in a way that would be true to the cognitive epistemology of our crisis of our time, but translating that back into traditional language, we're gonna, I will try to talk about how to, at least how I would try to be doing that, then it has, to, there has to be that new translation of what's true at the natural level, at the Feuerbachian level, right? Then you have to translate it back into traditional language, and that that has to map itself on to the master matrix of the tradition, presumably the New Old Testament or the New Testament or rabbinic literature or church fathers. And then it has to be livable within a community, right? In other words, or it doesn't have to necessarily be shared by everybody in the community, but that you could live in that community without being a hypocrite, right? Because you may have to live in your own consciousness in the, but you have to be back in the community without being a hypocrite. If it becomes a public theology, then it has to be formulated in a way that other people in that community could say, yes, it resonates in some way. But not everybody's going to follow that path. And they're going to say, well, you know, so-and-so is sold out to postmodernism, and so-and-so is sold out to this. But we'll, we'll get to that. But I think that there are various considerations that are involved, but ultimately, and I, where I want eventually want to get to, I think, um, and I think there's a great work that was written in, in Christian theology that hasn't fully um, been taken fully into account. I mean, I want to get to this issue of the community, the confessional, the community of interpretation. But Josiah Royce, in I think it was 1913, 1914, wrote. A, a great work, or it was a great work then, it's probably still a great work now, even though people don't read it. That, if you don't read it doesn't mean it's not a great work. It was called The Problem of Christianity. And in The Problem of Christianity, he put at the center the community of interpretation. And I think that that is fundamental. I don't think Jews have ever forgotten that, but these are not always placed. But the issue, of, it's not just community of faith. It's a community of interpretation, right? That you are within the same network of translations, right? Uh, a community of faith is something that can become a little bit more dogmatic and limited. But we'll come back to that. For some communities, the community of faith and the community of interpretation is one and the same thing. But we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how that plays itself out. I, uh, I, I want to get there, but I'm not... I'm saying that um, Catholics understood that by tradition. Protestants 
know that, but they ha- but it's 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 placed within a certain. Kind. They don't want to see it because of sola scriptura. How much it's really a community of interpretation, and some Jews understand it, and some Jews don't. Right, Reformed Jews are back in sola scriptura. So it's a question of how that plays itself out. It, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, Logan and then uh, and then we'll go on. It seems like in the book of Job, and why I keep pressing in Elihu, and why... Why what? Why I keep pressing in Elihu is because it seems like what? It's, yeah, it's okay. in Elihu there are these this kind of hints towards these terminal tasks that you just kind of elaborated on about, you know, rebuilding the cognitive structure, and that kind of... The end point is turning into kind of an ethic for community life. Um, and... A spiritual and, ethic. A spiritual ethic, right. And um, I just think that it's interesting that he chooses Elihu as his point of departure, really, because within Elihu's kind of speech, there is a disruption in the norms and values that kind of seem to govern theological discourse of the time, being that he was the youngest, but he was the wisest. And because he had this prophetic vision, he was able to insert himself into this discourse where he didn't really belong. Right. Well, you know, he also, it's important because he's a transitional figure, right? Uh, stylistically and structurally. Yeah. Um, so Svi and then Steve, and then I want to move on to the Cohen. Uh, regarding the uh, philosophical interpretation of Job on behalf of Maimonides, I was wondering whether a philosophical ex- explication requires a requires first the suspension of some aspects of traditions, like the authority, actual mitzvot or the literal, the literal aspect of mitzvot or rather, and then return back to mitzvot right after we were able to kind of establish a kind of deeper meaning of scripture itself and understand the mitzvot for the halachot in a kind of deeper sense or is it that Mamad is distinguished within the scripture itself between like I would, I would say two different I would say levels or creates a hierarchy between uh, the Deuteronomy the for example and Job uh, claiming that we first must address the philosophical aspect of scripture itself in order to kind of after that be able to arrive at the the more normative kind of aspect of scripture of scripture which, which will be established on the first aspect so is it a suspension or I think it's well I would uh, we'll have to see how we go but I would I think it's a susp- I think it's a cognitive break it's a cognitive break um and that one has to come back to this with a new cognition, right? Um, the rabbis speak about this as tam meha mitzvot, the rationale for the commandments. But that means that you're placing your action within the framework of spiritual understanding, right? So the spiritual understanding is where the break happens and it's where the rebuilding has to take place. So the break as a suspension, which is be- it begins in a, as a suspension and then returns back to the I would think the so. The linking yeah. of uh, Mishnah Torah. Yeah, yeah, first. yeah. Okay. All right, so let's take a quick look at Cohen. I want to make a couple of points. So the point where I, I just want to come in at a particular moment with Cohen because of time flying by um, so where um, Cohen wants to emphasize in his paragraph 17 after he separates the false positions of pessimism and pantheism he says that monotheism so this is going to be his particular take because he wants to reground the whole theology on what on what radical monotheism really means. And what radical monotheism means is a new understanding of how suffering fits into the divine order. Right? And then he moves in his own, and I'm just, uh, the section that I gave you He then moves totally independently in relationship to the key issues. So his take is a twofold take. Towards the neighbor, look at the second paragraph. This is fundamental. That towards the neighbor, 
your only attitude when a person is suffering is compassion. Right? So he, in a sense, there's an implicit critique of the friends. Right? Towards a neighbor who's suffering, you have the true monotheist doesn't make any judgments about the other person because you don't know because you don't know and so there, first the task is creaturely compassion towards the other but radical monotheism makes a very different cognitive claim upon the self and that the self must regard suffering as a punishment you demand that upon oneself suffering is the punishment that man demands inexorably of himself for himself in other words it forces the self into a radical self-consciousness that suffering that you have to bring yourself to the awareness that suffering is a fact of existence and that you have to be willing to suffer for others in other words it has immediate and direct ethical implications for Cohen's philosophical theology. In other words, he's, he's reading off the top of Job, but what Job has to learn. Job has to come to the consciousness, the friends have to come to the realization that they simply have to have compassion for another person. And Job, but the person who is suffering has to be grateful for the suffering because it puts one into a, a new realization that one becomes submissive to the divine order and one is willing to suffer and help another person. So for Cohen's radical ethical philosophy the issue of the improvement of the suffering and the poor and the needy is absolutely crucial. And the only way that you get to that consciousness is to allow yourself to realize that if you're suffering, you, haven't, you have to come to the awareness of the submission of the self to the suffering order of existence and to atone for the fact, that's the goal of the Day of Atonement, that one hasn't come to the awareness of bringing one's care to other persons to benefit the social order. So, the demand upon the self for Cohen, that what you lear learn from the book of Job is what we've been seeing is he says uh, on 21 where he accepts Maimonides teaching in Elihu is that suffering is a prophecy it's part of God's redemptive plan right so here a radical neo-Kantian is actually taking a very different notion of divine providence and suffering. Part of God's redemptive plan for humanity is to help you realize the inescapable fact of suffering and to bring suffering into a prophetic consciousness where you suffer and care for others. Right? And he's taking this in Jewish terms. It sounds very Christian, but he's saying this in very in particular Jewish terms. And the place of that heightened confession of consciousness is particularly the Day of Atonement. So that becomes the paradigmatic 
confessional structure for that, although it could take place on other issues. So to claim that I'm suffering and I haven't sinned means that I am disconnected from the real meaning of suffering. Right? I'm still seeing this in a cause and effect way. But he's saying what I have to come to is the realization that there is a prophetic teaching in my suffering. Namely, that all people suffer and that I am particularly suffering because I'm not fully aware. I have to bring that into my mind that I have not gone to the depths of what it means to understand suffering, which means I have to suffer for another person. So it's an attempt at, to create a new redemptive moment and God, that's why Elihu is providing a prophetic teaching. The prophetic teaching is that God's true teaching is that suffering is to create a higher moral awareness. And not just a higher personal, which is not just moral, it's a spiritual awareness. And that if you try to escape from suffering, or you try to interpret it on the calculus of what I did wrong, you don't face the fact that suffering is part of existence to create a new order of care between persons. So there is a direct exponent between suffering and ethics. Okay? Now maybe if he gets that, when we were inter inter interpreting the end of Job, that obviously this sympathetic care, he turns towards the neighbor. But Cohen takes it in a different radical way that's a little bit, at least for me, difficult to swallow, that this is part of the providential intention of divinity. That is to say, the redemptive curve of existence is to bring about the awareness of suffering, to bring about the awareness of my responsibility to others who are suffering humans and that that will create the new ethical order that he in the end of the 19th century is concerned about, right? He was very much concerned with liberal politics, the treatment of the minorities and the poor, the acceptance of the Jew in the Christian society, he wrote tracts against um, the outbreak of anti-Semitism after the First World War. But he, it wasn't just a parochial issue, it was a universal concern that he has. So, um, and then he makes the claim from another point of view, which is why he would then go beyond what we've seen, let us say, the first order. If you're willing to suffer, this is Cohen's argument, and at this level I think it's very profound. Or let's say it's profound that I can accept it. <laughs> yeah. But he would say that if I'm willing to accept the facticity of suffering, whether or not I see this as God's plan, but if I, as soon as I'm aware that suffering is something that I have to become conscious of as a positive cognitive awareness, I no longer treat my personal or religious life in the, the care of myself as an organism. In other words, I transcend myself as creature and I become a religious person. That is the core of what Cohen wants to get to and what the true monotheistic argument is. And Logan was outside, but that's the truth of Elihu in that case, right? 
So the truth then of Elihu, I'll just repeat it again so that you can hear it. The truth of Elihu is prophetically to reveal that suffering is the truth of existence. And it is its true religious exponent is what we call ethics. But it's really the radical monotheistic response to suffering, which is the fact of mortal life. And then we turn to the neighbor with compassion. Right? Then we're able to turn. And what it means is, because this is his concern, right? Maimonides didn't help us at the point how do you get beyond creature care? Right? So that might have been Job, or it may have been others, or you do the law for creature care, so things will be good with me. But he's saying the imperative of radical monotheism, as opposed, let's say, pantheism, which is concerned with creature care, or um, or pessimism, it's all crap, so I don't, care. I don't have to care about anybody. Now, the pessimistic notion is all, it's, it's all in the fan, it's all crap, so I don't care, so I, everybody's on their own, right? The other notion would be, so how do you get to the point of absolute transcendence of your natural need? That's the challenge for him of radical monotheism, that you are more than a creature and it's a place where that religious awareness translates itself into what you call ethics, but it's really religious compassion for your neighbor. And that's God's plan. Now, that's a point where I can't go, but where he wants to go. That God's pedagogy, that there is a redemptive arc and that the redempt... So it's a little bit hard to say if you look at... Uh, at Ecuador and all these kinds of things, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit hard to swallow. But um, from his point of view, you can, you can understand at least some takeaway that you can get from Cohen. But again, it's a regrounding of where you stand. In other words, the fundamental fact of existence now is suffering for all of these people. And then what do you do with that consciousness? You protect yourself, you run to the supermarket and buy all the peanut butter and no one else can have it because there may be a flood, right? What do you do? Right, that's a theological review. I want to get all the peanut butter, so I, I hoard, right? <laughs> right? Um, uh, but in other words, he, that is a fact, and then how do you get beyond that so that you would actually do something for another. So to say the larger notion that all the horrors of the world is part of the divine plan I think is obscene. But you can but you see that part of the task of trying to say what is distinctive about monotheism is its ethical side. So he's an ethical monotheist in the classic 19th sense. What's distinctive about monotheism is its ethical side, which means it is radically broken f from paganism, from his point of view. What's the radical break with paganism? That you're just part of the cycle of nature, and as nature is red in tooth and claw, and you take care of yourself, or you take care of your family or you take care of the people that you love, and everybody else can screw and be damned, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be, from his point of view, that's the pagan side of things. To escape from absolute naturalism, which is self-care, family care, with no spiritual issue, I'm just going to take care of ourselves, right? But the ability to suspend personal need for other need, for him, is the absolute founding point of radical monotheism and the building block of his new religious life. So for him, too, 
the presupposition of Job is can you suffer for nothing? Can you serve God for nothing? Uh, and he doesn't say it this way, but I'm adding that. In other words, that would be his take on the Satan's question. Satan is the pagan, right? No one would serve God for nothing. You have to get some benefit. Everybody has an end in mind. To serve God for nothing would mean I have to be willing to put myself at risk and to enter onto the arc of supererogatory action. Right? And the challenge of monotheism, does it, you see that it's a broad category, but Job now, the book of Job, becomes the, piv- the, the thin wedge upon which you rebuild your religious life. Because this becomes a new starting point, right? Right? So Cohen keeps maybe a certain notion of, well, I don't even know, I, I, I actually don't know how he would answer this, but you know, part of the issue after the First World War was the radical break with a naive, utopian, um, uh, idealism of uh, everything is progressing towards a higher end. And for Jewish and Bart and Rosenzweig, all of, from 13, from 1913 on, the realization of evil and horror and divine absence and that things are not on a natural curve, everything's getting better and better every day, right? So that shock of the First World War may in part be playing in, but he is now recalibrating this in a way that it may be a long redemptive path, but Judaism can't abandon the notion of redemption. Right? So now he sees that the lesson of suffering is to serve the goal of redemption. That's his new radical founding of Judaism or Jewish theology. That once there is a break between the transcendent God and creation, and it's not all one as, let us say, in a certain kind of pagan notion, that the human being has a task, and that task is redemptive suffering for the other. And that is the first and only commandment, or the founding commandment. It's, you know, the one thing needed. The one thing needed is to come to that consciousness. It's not faith, it's a new realization. That the one thing needed is to be, to overcome your creature needs and become a religious person. And to become a monotheist, in that sense, is to care for another person who is created in God's image. So that becomes the core. But again, you can see that it's not a simple reading of the book of Job. All the features of the book of Job are in it. But he's trying to reground a religious and cognitive structure to go forward that is his own creative rereading out of the book of Job of what an honest Judaism would mean for him. So then all the commandments are serving the goal of caring other persons and that becomes the criterion if something in his, from his liberal point of view isn't working. Right? Right? Then that would be the measure um, where the monotheistic goal has broken down or it's not being served in the highest way. Yeah. No, yeah, yes. Um, 
I was wondering, I feel that this is a very uh, prescriptive typology. Uh, like, you know, you have the pagan route and then you have the monotheistic route. Mm -hmm. And the pagan one is the one that you actually don't care about the other, or at least in principle you don't. And you need the radical monotheist to be able to do it. But I like one word you used there because the, the conception of divine order here seems to be very obscene to me too. Because if that is the case, providence, uh, perfect, yeah, yeah. providence or the kind of order that yeah. is implying yeah. this kind of oppression, because you need this kind of suffering. And the example of Ecuador, I think, is great. It's like, how do you explain that and make sense of that in this kind of framework? Apparently, you need something like that to be able to realize that you need to care for the neighbor. And I guess what, what I feel, I feel very comfortable with is the idea that uh, uh, the, call it the, the pagan way or the pagan route or whatever can't uh, uh, account for that. And I think there is, I mean, it's just a typology that's very prescriptive. There is no evidence to say something like that. And I just wonder if he feels any kind of uneasiness with this way to just put these very, uh, I don't know, like different poles with, without like... Well, it's hard to know. I mean, this was published posthumously. I, I think that the, I think the, the issue that we have to face is... Um, I, or let's, let me put it in more abstract terms, which would be part of that theological construction. Um, essential to his notion of Judaism, which would not exclude Christianity in this sense, is that it, it, take, it, it lives within the order of history and not just nature. Okay, That would be a different way of phrasing that. It's not the cycles of nature which are essential, but it's the destiny of history. Okay? So that's one core thing. And if there is a destiny to history, is there any meaning to suffering if you want to believe that history has some kind of redemptive goal? Right? If you don't want to put redemption in a key position in your theology, you could do lots of other things, or you could maybe take Cohen in a different way. But Cohen wants to emphasize we, our life is not governed simply by the cycle of nature, because that, then you just be caring about whether you're eating enough. Right? Or that would be Job in chapter 1. You make sure that everything is going right. Right? So what are, what are the theological implications of living in time? Where time is a historical factor and not a natural factor. And that people in time suffer. What is, what is the fundamental spiritual moral task and does that have a redemptive purpose to it? In other words, or can I use that in a redemptive way? Now he adds this issue that it's providential, and I think a lot of us would feel that that is an obscene theology. But what he's trying to get to, or that you would have to account to if it's not obscene to you, is is there meaning to history in which suffering is allowed by God? From his point of view, right? If suffering is there, what does it do for you? And from his point of view, it can't simply mean that that leads me to some kind of consciousness that of personal redemption through the suffering of a divine savior. It means commitment into the community. In other words, it can't be personal, right? So whether that could be a theological move for many Christians, obviously. But if the goal is not just my own personal, I realize suffer and the suffering is part of the true process that I have to come to be aware of and that I'm aided in that transcending consciousness by an awareness of Christ and so on. But he wants to get you into a communal consciousness, right? 
And so the same challenge would apply to a Christian once salvation is more than just personal ex- salvation, it, right? Then you're still back into this issue of what does the suffering do for you in terms of that larger order. You know, if the larger cosmic order is suffering and that that is a cosmic Christ, that could be a solution, but it's, it's moving in that broad communal historical dimension, right? I think the Eastern Church could take that a little bit easier, but anyway, yeah, you want to? Just um, going back to the Asian typology, because I think that the Romanists suggest extrapolating the say of a cycle, so cycles of nature and cycles of uh, a more historical understanding of the development of human, uh, uh, humanity. There are many, I guess, little options there, and I'm just wondering, uh, what could you say? I'm thinking about uh, Marxist understanding of history, especially. There's a nice uh, autobiography uh, by this French thinker, uh, what's his name? Ignace Lep, From Marx to Christ. And I was very touched when I read this many years ago, because one thing that he says in the... What's uh, his last name? Uh, L-E-P-P. Okay, name. okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, I think it was very well known in, in the, as far as I understand the 60s, but nobody agrees with anyone. But anyways, um, that says there that when he was uh, in France leading, uh, I think, the, the youth of the Marxist party there, like, he never felt a sense of first lack of meaning being a materialist atheist, if you want to put those terms. And second, never felt this lack of interest for the neighbor actually was quite a country. He's committed to Marxism was exactly, I guess, what Colin is talking about here, like this uh, openness to the neighbor, this, this notion of care for the other, very powerful. When he converted to Christianity, he claims in the autobiography, he never felt that, that, that the prior stage was just you know something that was meaningless or anything like that. It just kind of uh, reshaped some of the prior beliefs. But in a sense that you know, his understanding of history prior to Christianity was uh, less powerful, less meaningful, it just was a little bit different. But may, so maybe the issue of liberation theology goes in a different direction, but I think we, you, um, some forms of, pri- uh, of personal salvation is a different thing, but I think he's dealing with a, a form of liberation theology of a certain type where that deepens the commitment and the theological resonance, or the challenge, right? Yeah. So then it becomes a different notion of the model of Jesus within the world, right? So it, it can't be done without a theological reinterpretation. I what I'm trying to, to uh, point to, and I will just uh, stop here, is uh, I think that there are other ways to, to read uh, this polar position between natural cycles and historical okay. religious right, cycles right. that don't uh, um, need a kind of radical monotheistic option first. Mm-hmm. And second, I think the way that this coin puts that here, and I'm uh, not an expert in coin at all, but it is in this text, uh, poses a much more difficult problem for the monotheists than for the atheists, which is you need to explain divine order in this context, whereas the atheist doesn't and can commit to the neighbor in a very powerful way yeah. as this uh, French thinker did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sympathetic with that, yeah. No, I, I, just an aside, I, I completely agree that Marxism is nothing else but an inverse Christianity. Uh, I don't uh, leave it at that. But uh, I think uh, at the back of Cohen, I mean, as you were talking, the, 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 the specter that came wasn't Marx but Kant. Right? This is exactly a brilliant fusing of, of the book of Job and Kant because his account of suffering, Cohen's, is. Ex- is very much uh, Kant's account of freedom, yes. which is exactly uh, geared against, uh, let's say, a natural or naturalistic uh, account of, of, of reality, mainly based on cause and effect. And it is Kant's concern to extract the human being, and for that matter, the issue of ethics, from that entire uh, uh, Nice, 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 nice. I think I think you may be right. I think he, you're right. very nice. And, and yeah. So, so uh, it is. Uh, Collins is brilliant how he reads, rereads Kant through Job, if you want. So it is, the realization of suffering becomes our ethical freedom. Right. Yeah. Or, or or suffering is for Collins as it is as freedom is for Kant. The best example that we are indeed not just a mere cog in the wheel of cause of natural existence.
right? right. So, so uh, but but it's brilliant how uh, how Cohen reads it. That, yeah, that yeah, precisely. nice. And therefore, uh, some, uh, I think his answer is, is brilliant because if you think of Ecuador, it's very hard to explain that indeed as a result of some cause of cause and effect, right? So ultimately, as we uh, suffering. Uh, is as deep as a mystery as freedom and as the issue of evil. There is no way to put it into any kind of economy right. or equation. Right. And, uh, uh, so, so, yeah, so in a certain sense, you know, it puts the onus back on the self to care for just the person who's right next to you. In other words, the, the theological task is simply to turn to the, the, uh, that's what he understands the neighbor who's, who's near you, the one who is absolutely near you. And that's, so that becomes, and that that has a redemptive path to it. Um, but I mean, I think we're, yeah. we're bothered a little bit by the, this larger sense of pr providential structure. But I, I, the, the, my point now is not to justify Cohen, but to help us see the need to take the fact of raw existence yeah. and use the book of Job as a building point for rethinking. In other words, there's one thing that no one can deny. There's incomprehensible suffering. Yeah. And what do you do yeah. with incomprehensible suffering? What is the true religious or moral wisdom in the face of incomprehensible yeah. suffering? And that becomes the starting point of a religious theology. Yeah, yeah but and for Kant, does, how, how do you explain radical freedom, like freedom itself, or the issue, he does talk about the issue of radical evil. But uh, right. just as Kohn, I think, is really, he actually reads Kant against Kant, because in Kant you don't have that notion of the neighbor compassion, right? It, right. It, it, right. You cannot really find Kant, that's the big problem. Right, right, right. 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 So that's why he's brilliant, I think. Right, 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 right. I said to it quickly, and then I want to uh, just because we uh, I want to make sure we uh, get Salvation Kierkegaard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ay, 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 ay. You can see I can't keep oy I can't keep oy vey, I can't keep time. Okay, all right. Um, maybe this is a helpful pivot to Salvation, but if the kind of example of Ecuador and divine providence and Cohen bothers us, I think Salvation has a nice alternative with the idea that uh, what awakens us to uh, this kind of ugliness and sharpness. Uh, like starts an existential consciousness is kind of sickness, and for some reason the idea of the divine providence of sickness probably doesn't bother us as much as say an earthquake in a different country where you know there are hundreds of people dying kind of about sickness. So it tunes us uh, these sorts of things. Right. Okay. All right. Let's come back. I want to come back. Yeah. I, I, yeah he, well, he's trying to find a pivot point in his own life yeah. where he was jerked out of a certain form of consciousness, and he wants to share that. So he, in a certain sense, he's different from the Maimonidean ar or the Cohen argument. He's not giving an abstract. He's trying to speak to a situation philosophically, but then also add a personal voice, which the others were not doing. Let's have, very quickly, Stephen, and I want to make a couple of other... Uh, it seems to me Cohen has not dealt at all with what I view the major aspect of Job, which was the not know knowing not knowing. Uh, he seems to be saying, I know, and the know is that suffering has this redemptive quality and care for the neighbor. So he's missed, it seemed to me, what I saw as the message of Job is to appreciate what you don't know as part of your knowing. Number one, and number two, it seems to me that the love your neighbor is really getting down to a kiba, a rather basic Jewish thought right. uh, through a very different route. Yeah, I'm not sure that he has to go there. I mean, he, you don't have to know the meaning ultimate meaning to know that I have to transform suffering into healing. Uh, anyway, let's, let, let, I want to just make a couple of quick points about um, Soloveitchik and Kierkegaard, and I apologize for the brevity um, um, of this. So, um, I, I, I'll put, so the, the material I gave you was out of the whirlwind, and I also added a section that I just passed out from Job, um, which goes on to another chapter in that book on the message of suffering 
Um, and as you see in 152, Job the religious Philistine. So um, I realize that that adds another um, quality to that. It's interesting, the page before that, we talked about Job's religious Philistine, just so that you can understand the broad-mindedness of Rabbi Soloveitchik. Um, he cites Emil Brunner and how much he was influenced by Brunner in, on the divine imperative to come to this realization. So we're not, we're, we're not dealing with parochial stuff by any means. But uh, that's a different subject. Um, um, and the impact of Brunner's divine imperative on uh, Soloveitchik and Neo and that form of orthodoxy has to be, should be worked out much more fully. In any case, the same way he was influenced by Karl Barth as well. But the, but the um, I just want to make a couple of um, points uh, because you've read the material and you can go back and read it. Um, so he wants to make a distinction between a natural creature and what happens through the revelation of suffering. Right? So the natural, there, there is a natural creature, like rabbits, presumably, or squirrels, and they don't suffer, they just have pain. So he wants to understand pain, uh, uh, the difference between pain and suffering, to be the difference between um, a lack of reflective consciousness and a reflective consciousness of what it means, what are the implications, what is the meaning, etc. So suffering, um, sorrow and suffering is a spiritual moment or potentially spiritual moment for Soloveitchik because it takes you out of what some people would call the umwelt. You're simply in the natural environment to the Lebenswelt. You're into the human world and what it means to live in the human spiritual world. And for him, that means this consciousness of both, and this is a feature that appears in his different writings, both the grandeur of the self and the nihility of the self. Right? The self has a certain kind of cosmic grandeur as it realizes its great ability to comprehend, to do something with suffering, um, to yearn towards God and the cosmic order. And then suffering can also produce this radical nihility or the sense of limitation, um, nothingness, um, the pretensions of knowledge, etc. And some people can get to this new awareness through sickness or suffering, or the awareness of the death um, of, of an, uh, he has other parts where the, the death of his wife or himself, his own notion of his own illness um, brings you to this new consciousness. Other people, for example, Job is brought out of what he calls the Philistine. The Philistine consciousness is the Aristotelian. You just want things for yourself. In other words, the Philistine mind is the self that is self-absorbed and concerned. And the issue is to get to a consciousness either through your awareness of yourself in reflection or it has to come through a shattering cataclysm which for him would be um, the voice out of the whirlwind or the Elihu material. In other words, there's something that becomes shattering that breaks down all these resistances. Logan was talking about the hedge but um, all the things that are cognitively protective, one's theological or ideological position, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then, for him, the existential side is that you realize the, ra the reality and the radicality of temporality, right? That 
the, fi- the finality and the limitation of life. And the question that he says, Mi anochi, who am I? So this, the question becomes a turning inward of realizing the nihility of the self, but also the grandeur of the self that yearns towards God. I think one of the important features for um, Salavashik from this point of view that we've been discussing with the book of Job is not only to see the gradual transformation of the self who is self-absorbed to become a religiously conscious person by the end of the book, who becomes aware through cataclysm and cosmic cataclysm of the limited nihility of, in, in, in his terms, uh, of existence, and then the care for others. So for, for him, the issue of being able to pray for Eliphaz becomes the beginning of moral awareness and his moral consciousness. But there's another aspect that I find very compelling in Soloveitchik's argument, is that being aware of these polarities is not just to think of polarities, but he wants you to integrate the polarities. So he says, on the one hand, there is an ontic significance to the self. I am really an anochi, I'm really an I. I really am an I. And it has lots of meaning. I have a family, I have children, etc., etc., and my life is really significant. And then there is the nihility. You know, me anochi, what am I? Who am I? Where is it in the larger spectrum of things? That's one polarity that says you have to keep both in mind. It's not just one or the other. You have to get to a point through both that you don't lose the dynamic poles. The second one is this awareness of order, right? The order of nature, the tremendous apocalyptic disclosure of being that Job is aware of as this stupendous sense um, um, of natural um, uh, features, which he calls order. And then the other side, which is related to the nihility, is that ultimately it's tohu, it's, it's chaos. And that both are true. And then the third aspect is there's one side that affirms, I affirm my life, I affirm my experience, I affirm my suffering, and there's another side that negates. It negates the self, I'm a nothing, I despise myself, etc. And um, one of the key features of Soloveitchik is not just these polarities, but a consciousness that swings between the two having and not having, seeking God and not having God, Um, the majestic order and the limited sense of reality. And for him, and this is, I think, a key point within that, there are two key points then. One is to think both is to escape from any notion of totalization. So that makes him in that kind of the modern move against totality totalization. In other words, I can't have one thought that becomes the total new cognitive way that I, it's not like it's all ontologically real or it's all just nihil. It's all affirmation or negation, right? It's all. It's not all my, the power of my mind, or the limitation of my mind, right? 
It's not the, the huge value of my life and the insignificance of my life. Right? It's not just the meaningfulness of what I'm doing and it disappears in this cosmic speck of being nothing. But to, it's, it's measureless and it's measurable. So he's asking us, can you, put, can you hold both together? Maybe at different moods you move towards one or the other, but you can't forget the other pole, or you totalize, or you fall into a false consciousness. So he's trying to rebuild that consciousness so that you don't slide into totalization. That's one side. The other side is that for him, once you are aware of these dimensions, he's saying the rabbinic, the Bible presents this in the starkest possible terms. The rabbinic tradition makes this livable in a religious pattern of life. That's why he goes to the halakha. Right? So for him, the meaning then of the commandments is to reinforce these double dimensions at different levels of consciousness. Some commandments do more than the other, but in the main, there is this yearning of the achievement of knowledge and there's the limit of the sacred community. And the two are uh, the dignity of dealing with death and the fact of death. Right? Um, the dignity of love and the loss, etc. And the halacha for him exemplifies these dimensions in its, in its uh, fullness. And by keeping all of these together, there is a limitation um, of the totalitization. Let me just make one um, comment about um, Kierkegaard in this respect. Maybe we'll come back to this next week, but I don't, uh, because of time, I want to at least get this, and then we have a couple of minutes for questions. The genre that Kierkegaard uses is the genre of the sermon and the teacher. So in much of his writings, the notion of who the true teacher is and how to become a disciple of the true teacher is crucial. And if you read through this sermon, you can see the emphasis that Job is a teacher. And not just because he preaches, because he acts on it. He lives out that. So this, this, this notion that was important for Kierkegaard of the decision to act on the basis of one's realization of the truth of existence. It has to be enacted and embodied. So then you can learn from him in a powerful way. And he's not just a preacher. He is a teacher. Because he embodies the truth of what he's saying. And then you can learn from that um, for the possibility of your life in the future because you can trust Job because he just wasn't a talker. And in the first two chapters, you can see him acting out the concreteness of his spiritual life. Okay? I think among the many astonishingly profound things that Kierkegaard says in this sermon, um, and maybe we'll, come, I, we'll have to come back to it, but one has always stood out for me is his statement that when Job first confronts suffering and he falls to the ground and he shaves himself and he uh, bows before God, his first statement is that the Lord has given, not the Lord has taken. In other words, it's the consciousness of having received 
life and blessing. Not the feeling of loss. That the sense of loss includes what he says, the fundamental spiritual disposition of gratitude. And one of the reasons we can learn from Job as a sufferer is because he didn't forget gratitude of what he had, which is the reason he has the pain for the loss. And so in the framework of loss and suffering, he first expresses the gratitude of the gift of life and the goods that he had. So gratitude becomes this fundamental awareness and disposition, even in this case of radical sorrow and suffering. But also for Kierkegaard, in a sense, the rebuilding of the religious life has to incorporate Job consciousness into the center of your mind. And that, I think, is the overall thrust of what I've been trying to do in today's class. No matter, I haven't, I, I guess I didn't get to the point where I say, well, where I will rebuild, but that's where I'll begin next week. Is Job is a center point of consciousness for scripture. And for everyone who reads that scripture, then it becomes a recentering point. If you take the teaching seriously, it becomes a recentering point for the priorities of spiritual values and understandings going forward. And in every single case, there was a hermeneutical reappropriation, a singling out of particular things that then become the new ground zero if a religious life is going to be rebuilt with honesty. So he, Job now becomes the touchstone for theological honesty. It's, it's because the range of issues that are touched upon are so comprehensive and so honest, and the different genres bring everything into consciousness, that this becomes for this Hebraic, Jewish, Christian foundation point, a, a matrix for rebuilding, even if one is moving forward in new ways. And what we find so interesting is that each of these new appropriations can't let the Job consciousness go, and it appears to be fairly axial or central in the new religious consciousness that's being rebuilt. Because it, what it's really saying is that you have to deconstruct or the book itself is deconstructing. And then you have to reconstruct through a re-understanding that Job becomes part of that cognitive reconstruction of theology. And not to do that would be at a le all of the writers are saying is at a lesser plane. What that lesser plane is is described differently by the different authors, but it's not to move to the fully conscious spiritual plane that they believe that Job got to. Um, the final thing that I would want to leave you with, maybe I'll pick up with this next time, and I think that. I think Kierkegaard at least forces it on my mind, and I probably should force it on your mind as well. Because if chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken, may the name of the Lord be blessed, is this key point, right? Is this key point? And that that becomes the most perfected expression of serving God for nothing, for naught, of a pure religious attitude, right? Which for Kierkegaard it is, right? It's the most radical um, statement of radical divine service. Then the question 
imposes itself, or at least imposes itself to me, how, in what way, is Job's final confession the same or different? If he then says, I confess and I have relent and I have compassion for persons, and he ends in chapter 42 with a statement of confession which ultimately puts him <coughs> into a state of radical divine otherness and that he serves God with this new consciousness. Is that, that is the question I want to leave you with, is that the same as the Job who confessed in chapter 1? Or is this a different type of religious consciousness? Maybe we'll pick up with this next week, and then um, I will make the transition to why I think the Book of Job is fundamental for the modern religious consciousness um, um, as well. So um, I know I didn't uh, cover Kierkegaard as well as it should be dealt with. I will come back to this issue. Um, but I think uh, those points I did want to kind of underscore, but I think overall we have a, a lot to uh, muse about uh, on the basis of today. Please, um, I know it's be the Passover week, so it's hard for some people to do another table, but um, try to keep in mind uh, that s sooner rather than later I want to get papers um, uh, so we'll meet um, next week, and uh, I wish everybody well, and for those whom it's Passover, a very happy Absolutely. holiday.